Je suis Antonia Mayoni, je suis présidente euh, de la Fédération des sciences humaines après, euh, après une demi-heure peut-être, juste maintenant. C'est très récent, mais euh, je suis très contente d'être être parmi vous aujourd'hui parce que chaque année, notre conférence annuelle est une occasion spéciale de prendre un peu de recul, de réfléchir à propos euh, de nos disciplines d'une part et d'entamer un, di un dialogue honnête lucide et, on espère, toujours visionnaire sur l'avenir. Today's annual conference is no exception. We are fortunate to have the opportunity to reflect on the state of humanities and social sciences research in Canada with two leading thinkers on higher education, and it's my pleasure to introduce them now. I'll introduce them both now, and they'll come up one after the other to give their presentation, and then we'll have ample time for discussion uh, before, we, uh, before we break. Dr. Elliot Phipp Philipson is here. In one of his most recent positions, Dr. Philipson was chair of the expert panel on the state of science and technology in Canada, which released its report for the Council of Canadian Academies in September, last September 2012. Many of you have already seen it. Uh, Dr. Philipson has served as physician in chief at Toronto's Mount Sinai Hospital. He was also the Sir John and Lady Eaton Provencer of Medicine and chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. From 2004 to 2010, he served as President and CEO of the Canadian Foundation for Innovation, or as we know it, CFI, and Dr. Philipson has chosen to speak to us today about the key findings of his report, notably how they impact the social sciences and humanities. We'll also be joined by Alex Usher, who is President of Higher Education Strategy Associates and Editor-in-Chief of Global Higher Education Strategy Monitor. He's also worked at the Education Policy Institute of Canada, the Canadian Millennium Scholarship Foundation, and the AUCC, the Association of Universities and Colleges of Canada. I'm sure many of you already know who Alex is. Uh, you receive his uh, daily emails, uh, which are all comments on the state of higher education, and I encourage you to read his recent forays on the skills shortage debate, which led uh, our colleague uh, journalist Paul Wells to say, Alex Usher is earning his room and board. Since your email service is free, Alex, uh, I'm sure you feel good about that. Alex will be speaking to us today on the policy implications of the CCA report and how we can leverage the world of research and learning to imagine and shape Canada's future. Thank you both for being with us, and I'd now like to welcome Dr. Philipson to start our conversation. Uh, thank you, and let me say that it is a real pleasure for me to have the opportunity to uh, speak to you this afternoon <clears throat> on the Council's uh, report on the state of science and technology in Canada. Uh, I suspect most of you are familiar with the Council and, and pr probably even the report, but for those who are not, just a bit of background, the uh, report was commissioned by the Council of Canadian Academies in response <clears throat> to a request from the Minister of Industry. As you know, the Council is an independent, not-for-profit organization whose mandate is to conduct scientific, uh, science-based expert assessments that inform public policy. In other words, it's in the business of assessments based on evidence not in the business of advocacy or making recommendations. Uh, the panel, the Science and Technology panel, for which I had the privilege of serving as chair, uh, was comprised of 18 experts from across the country and internationally with varied discipline backgrounds, and we were supported by an absolutely superb staff team from the Council of Canadian Academies. The report, and I would stress again, as I will throughout, is evidence-based, and it builds upon and it expands an earlier report published in 2006 by the Council of Canadian Academies by the same title. And in fact, that was the first report, uh, the first assessment ever undertaken by the Council of Canadian Academies. Uh, they had the unenviable task in 2006 of completing the entire research and report writing in 12 weeks. 
Um, we undertook to do this uh, a little more slowly, uh, and it's extended over a better part of a year, year and a half. And as a result, I think it's fair to say that it's one of the most comprehensive, in-depth examinations of Canadian science and technology that's ever been undertaken. The charge for the expert panel, as I've indicated, came from Industry Canada via the Minister of Industry. And it was a straightforward question. What is the state of science and technology in Canada? We were asked to consider science broadly, and in fact to take into consideration all of the disciplines in which, in which research is conducted and supported by government, namely the natural sciences, engineering, health sciences, humanities, arts, and social sciences. There were a few sub-questions uh, that called for analysis of the specific disciplines of scientific strength, disciplines and technological applications, <clears throat> their geographic distribution across the country, international comparisons were deemed to be critically important, and what disciplines have improved or declined in the five years since the previous report, and what emerging trends could we elucidate. Our mandate focused specifically on research performed in the higher education sector as well as government and not-for-profit, but importantly, our mandate specifically excluded um, assessment of science and technology in the private sector, that is in industry, because there is a separate parallel panel to ours running about six months behind whose mandate is to examine um, R&D in the uh, private sector. So our job was to provide a diagnosis, that is an assessment of the state of science and technology. We did not prov provide any prescriptions nor recommend any particular policy directions. Now the concept of science and technology strength uh, is inherently very complex and there is no single measure or indicator that alone can assess the strength of any particular discipline. And therefore we had to develop a balanced complementary suite of measurement tools and indicators that incorporate both qualitative and quantitative measurements. And our focus was to determine Canada's standing in the global context. So let me stress that, uh, let me stress that right from here on. Our job was not to compare creative arts in Canada with physics and astronomy in Canada. Our task was to compare each of those and all the other fields with their counterparts globally. So we ended up using a variety of methodologies uh, that we felt would be inclusive and that would allow us to assess the magnitude, the quality, and the trends of science and technology in Canada compared with other advanced countries. So we used standard bibliometrics to measure both the output, the quantity of research, and its impact. We used advanced bibliometrics, some newer approaches, that allowed us to study international collaborations and country-to-country -country affinities, that allowed us to identify clusters of research and emerging uh, technologies, and to measure researcher migration from country to country. We used uh, technometrics uh, to study patents and IP flow, we used two opinion surveys, one of Canadian experts and one of top-sided international researchers. And we also undertook an analysis of S&T capacity in terms of highly qualified personnel and infrastructure and programs. <clears throat> Central to the study was the use of a 22-field classification system that comprised uh, 176 subfields, so 22 major fields 
containing collectively 176 subfields. And this classification system covered the entire spectrum of s and as I've indicated uh, earlier. And by using the same classification system throughout, we were able to compare among the various methodologies and to synthesize the information gained from the various methodologies uh, into a complete assessment of each uh, field. The particular classification, the field and subfield classification system that we used was uh, developed by Science Metrics, <clears throat> and it includes more fields in the humanities, arts, and social sciences than does the main alternative, which is the one used by the National Science Foundation for its science and engineering indicators. The bibliometric analysis that uh, we used uh, was based on Elsevier's Scopus database. And again, it was selected specifically because it's, it includes more journals in the humanities, arts, and social sciences than does Thomson Reuters' Web of Science. But I must point out that the, the, the classification system, the field classification system used throughout the study does not necessarily correspond with traditional academic departments or institutional structures. So by way of example, one of the 22 fields is entitled historical studies. And among its subfields are history, as it's commonly understood, but it also includes the subfields of anthropology, archaeology, classics, and paleontology, among others, all of which are undoubtedly historical in the broadest sense of the term, but within a traditional university structure, those various uh, subfields are generally scattered or may be scattered among several different faculties. Now, the panel was very sensitive to feedback that was received following publication of the 2006 report, particularly from your community, but not exclusively, that it had not adequately considered the unique circumstances of research dissemination in the humanities, arts, and social sciences. Because as you well know, better than we do, that is, we, the panel, for those disciplines, bibliometric measures are of somewhat limited value because peer-reviewed published articles are not necessarily the dominant means of disseminating new knowledge, as opposed to books and book chapters in the humanities and social sciences, and exhibitions, performances, uptake of design applications, digital media works, and software in the creative arts. And so being aware of the limitations and of the reaction to the 2006 report, I can tell you the panel made a very determined effort to collect information related to the modalities of knowledge dissemination that are more relevant to your disciplines but at the end of the day, and I must say we had several members from the uh, uh, arts, humanities, and social sciences disciplines on the panel, and you'll recognize many of the names. Greg Keeley, Sarah Diamond, Jackie Thayer Scott, uh, Fred Galt, uh, Rosa Fernandez from the United Kingdom. And even with all of their input and assistance, at the end of the day, we found the data that was available was sparse, it was often unreliable, and most importantly, it did not have international benchmarks with, or standards with which we could compare the Canadian output. And so as a result, we didn't use some of those newer approaches. We did use the bibliometric evidence that was available for uh, your disciplines together with the other modalities which are equally relevant to your disciplines as they are to others, uh, such as the international surveys.
Now, the report, and uh, I have a copy of it here, the report contains a wealth of information and data. And so in the few minutes that I have here, I'm simply going to give you a few of the highlights, uh, selected highlights. But in the question answer period, I'll be more than happy to go into more detail if you wish. In very broad terms, the report demonstrates that Canada's uh, research and development enterprise is internationally competitive and highly respected globally. For example, as indicated here, Canada ranks sixth in the world in terms of the average relative citation index. That is, uh, that's a measure of research impact. It's, uh, the specifics is it's the average of the number of citations of every paper in the field relative to other papers in the same field. In other words, all of these are field normalized. Canada produces 4.7% of the top cited 1% of papers. That is, of, of the 1% of papers that are most frequently cited in the world, Canada produces 4.7%, which is also sixth in the world. And by arc rankings, average relative citation rankings by field, place Canada among the five leading countries in seven of the 22 fields, that is roughly one third, and in 56 of 176 subfields, again, one third. This spider diagram presents Canada's ARC scores, the average relative citation, uh, field by field. They are arranged alphabetically beginning at 12 o'clock with agriculture, fisheries, and forestry. So as I've just mentioned, the ARC is a measure of how frequently papers in each field are cited relative to all other papers in the same field. The blue line the blue line is the world arc for each field, and that's been given a, a, a value of one. And then Canada's score relative to the world average is shown in red. So as you see, in virtually every field, the fields in Canada have arc scores above the world average. And some of the fields, such as visual and performing arts, Clinical medicine, physics, and astronomy are well above the world average. In fact, Canada's ARC score in visual and performing arts was the second highest in the world. And in clinical medicine and physics and astronomy, it was the third, third highest in the world. <clears throat> As I mentioned in the methods, we undertook two extensive surveys uh, to assess Canada's international stature and reputation. One from Canadian experts, which I'm not going to show you here, and one from international researchers around the world. The international survey was directed to the authors of the top 1%, the top 1% of the most frequently cited papers in each field during the past 10 years. So again, I would stress we identified the top 1% of the most frequently cited papers in each field and it was the authors of those papers who were the target for our survey. Much to our pleasant surprise, over 5,000 of these authors responded to the survey. And they were asked to identify their field and subfield of expertise, and then to list, in their opinion, the five leading countries in their area of expertise in terms of research originality, rigor, and impact. When the results, of course, were analyzed field by field, but when we aggregated all the fields, which is what's shown in this slide, 37% of the international uh, researchers identified Canada as one of the five leading countries in their field, which placed Canada fourth overall in the world behind the United States, United Kingdom, and Germany. And on a field-by-field -field basis, Canada was ranked among the top five countries in the world in 16 of the 20 fields. So shown here are the field-by-field -field results for the four top fields in the humanities and social sciences. 
all of which, these four, each of which was ranked third in the world by top-sided researchers in each particular field. So again, Canada's ranking is uh, indicated by its position on the bar graph, and the percentage of respondents who ranked each country among the top five in the world uh, in their field is indicated by the percentage beside each bar. Now, of considerable interest is the fact that for fields in the natural sciences, engineering, and health sciences, which are shown on this slide, there is a strong correlation between the bibliometrics and reputation. In this case, between the field's share of the top 1% of the most highly cited papers, the x-axis, and the percent of the survey respondents in that field that identified Canada as one of the top five countries in the world. Each data point in this slide represents one of the fields in the natural sciences, engineering, and health sciences. So the international reputation, at least, is highly correlated with Canada's share of the top 1% of the most frequently cited papers. In contrast, that relationship did not exist for fields in the humanities, the arts, and the social sciences, where the reputation, the y-axis, was not in any way correlated with the top 1%, the percent of the top 1% of papers in the world published by Canada. And that again emphasizes the point that research, that the um, importance of methods of research dissemination other than journal publications is very important in determining the international reputation of fields in the humanities, arts, and social sciences. Now let me turn briefly <clears throat> to a consideration of the specific fields of Canadian research uh, of strength. I mentioned earlier that the concept of s and strength is inherently very complex. It's multidimensional, and it cannot be assessed by any one measure or indicator alone. And therefore, depending on the weight given to the various indicators, different fields will emerge among the strongest. The panel utilized a number of tools and indicators uh, to assess the performance of each field the performance of each field in Canada compared to the worldwide performance of the field. But there were two measures that we felt were of particular relevance in determining the field's position relative to other advanced countries, because that was our major mission, relative to other advanced countries. And those two measures, as shown here, were the field's international average relative citation rank and its rank in the international survey. But other factors, such as the magnitude of the field in Canada, how big it is, and trends associated with its growth or decline, also inform the panel's analysis. Using that approach, we identified six research fields in which Canada excels on an international basis. And in alphabetical order, they are clinical medicine, historical studies, information and communication technologies, physics and astronomy, psychology and cognitive sciences, and visual and performing arts. How did we arrive at them? Well, this figure, and it's the only complicated figure, and I'll walk you through it, it demonstrates graphically how those fields were identified. Shown in this slide is the world rank uh, by arc of each field, that is along the x-axis, along the top, is the world rank of each field by arc. Arc, I would remind you, is a measure of impact of publications. And that's uh, plotted against the uh, international survey rank on the y-axis, which is a measure of reputation. The size of each bubble is proportional to the number of Canadian papers published in the field in 2005-10. And the color indicates whether Canada's share of world papers increased in green 
decreased in red or was unchanged in yellow in 2005-10 compared to the previous five years. And so the figure combines measures of impact, reputation, magnitude, and trend. Now the six fields that we identified as strengths are the four in the upper right box, visual and performing arts, clinical medicine, psychology and cognitive sciences, and historical studies, plus the one below, physics and astronomy, and the one immediately to the left, um, information communication and technologies. In five of those six fields, as you can see, that we identified as strengths, Canada's ARC rank is among the top five countries in the world. Similarly, in five of the six fields, Canada is also ranked among the top five countries in the world by leading international researchers in those fields. In five of the six fields, Canada's share, the green ones, Canada's share of world papers increased in 2005-10. Three of the fields, clinical medicine, ICT, and physics and astronomy, are among the largest research enterprises in the country in terms of the output of scientific papers. And one of the fields, ICT, alone accounts for 44% of Canada's patents. But I should also note that Canada performed very well in some of the other fields, particularly engineering, biology, public health and health services, and economics and business. Now, of course, much of the nuance of Canadian strength is at the subfield level. And as I mentioned before, in 56 of the 176 subfields, Canada is ranked among the top five countries in the world, but I'm not going to take time to show you the 756 subfields. But I would just point out that several of the subfields are in the humanities and social sciences. And by way of example, Canada's ARC ranking, the average relative citation ranking, was number one in the world in the subfields of classics, criminology, and business and management. And there were several other subfields in your disciplines that ranked second, third, fourth in the world by ARC. So what I presented is a small fraction, a very small fraction of the wealth of data that's available in the full report and in its, in its appendices, but hopefully enough to give you just a sense of the findings. Taken together, among other things, the findings demonstrate that Canada's science and technology enterprise is highly competitive and respected internationally, and it's grown in both output and impact since 2006 that Canada has particular strengths in at least six fields and several subfields of research, including a number in the humanities, arts, and social sciences. And one other conclusion that we came to that I think is particularly relevant uh, to your disciplines, and I'm, I know we're going to get into a discussion about this uh, shortly, and that is from the panel standpoint, since our mandate was to assess Canadian strains on a global scale, there's a need for the development of databases relevant to research output in the humanities, arts, and social science disciplines apart from bibliometrics, which of course already exist. So I'm going to stop there, and as I say, I'll be happy to go into more detail in the uh, question period that follows. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Antonia, for that uh, introduction. I'd never thought about how I could earn my room and board from a free email before, actually. I, um, <clears throat> so when Jean-Marc uh, asked me to, to uh, speak, I think it was for, uh, for three reasons. Um, First is that I know a little bit about uh, metrics and research metrics. You may know uh, my company does the uh, something called HiBar, which is a, a benchmarking exercise using uh, <coughs> H-index 
uh, values that we've got a, a, a database of 50,000 academics and we take a look, it allows institutions to do some comparisons, which are not entirely different from the kinds of things that you're doing, uh, but at a national scale rather than an international scale. Um, I think, so that's one reason I think I, I got invited and that I, you know, I'm, I'm an expert on that and know something about policy. Second reason I think is that I'm uh, a friend of, of the humanities and social sciences, a critical friend sometimes. Uh, but also third, let's be honest, I have a reputation for throwing grenades on the table. Um, and I'm, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I, I can usually be counted on for a lively discussion. So I didn't want to uh, disappoint Jean-Marc on this. You'll get a little bit of all three in here. Um, so the question that Jean-Marc posed really was, okay, so what, what do we take from the, the discussion that, uh, this, this paper, what's the, the policy implications, what can we actually learn, what, is it, what does it really mean? And first of all, let me say that um, I think the report is a, is a really excellent report. I mean, I have quibbles methodologically here and there, but as far as sort of international standards for these things go, for people who've tried to do it, I think it's excellent. Um, everyone should read it, everyone should, you know, ab ab absorb uh, some of those things, because I think the overall message that we have here, um, in the social sciences at least, um, is look, Canada is not outstanding, but we're above average, right? And that's good. You know, I think there's a lot of, there's very few bad stories to tell in that report. Um, and a lot of good stories, not world beating, not we're number one, not sort of chest thumping stuff, but it shows we have a solid record of effort and achievement in, in these fields. And this is something that we should be aggressively talking up, right? And I think Chad does a very good job of doing that. I think, you know, we, and, and Graham and everyone here, but I think, I think the kinds of messages that Chad had this morning, they're dead on, and the kinds of things that come out of Elliot's report, I think, back him up completely. I had a slightly different reaction when I read this about the humanities. Um, and I think basically, so if, if you ask me the question, what do we learn from this about the social sciences? Like I say, I think it's not outstanding, but, but above average. Uh, but if I look at the humanities, I think increasingly as I looked at it, I came, I had two questions about what it tells us about the humanities. You know, do we have world-class research in the humanities? And my two questions were really who knows and who cares? Um, so let me just go through that for a second. What do I mean by who knows? Why do we use research metrics in the first place as a way to look at ourselves and, and, and look at our output? And the answer is basically they're a prestige indicator. Okay? Prestige has always been the coin of the realm in academia since time immemorial. What started happening in the 1960s was we started getting computer databases of, of uh, publications. So the NSF, I think, uh, the, 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 big, the first big science metrics one was uh, 61, the social science index was about 1964, and people started taking advantage of those things to sort of see, okay, what do we learn if we do this? And the first people to do it was the National Science Foundation in the United States, and they started ranking graduate programs. I know today we actually think, oh man, ranking's terrible, but actually, there wasn't a lot of controversy about the NSF rankings when they came in in the 60s. In fact, the controversy about rankings really only started when we tried measuring undergraduate education through things like U.S. News and World Reports starting in the mid-80s, McLean's in the late 80s. Um, and the reason there wasn't a lot of controversy was because when, you know, people started using these bibliometric measures to look at, you know, what, how did uh, the, you know, the political science department of Wisconsin look against the political science department at, at, uh, at Columbia, they more or less confirmed what people thought. I mean, there's no absolute standards of excellence here, right? I mean, it's still, it's a community of judgment where we have peers and we, we have the respect of our peers. And basically, when those NSF rankings started coming out, people said, yeah, that's about right. Um, and there's still not, I mean, there's still some quibbles about NSF, but on the bibliometric measures, I don't think there is a lot. <clears throat> um, and then people started noticing that, hey, those big concentrations of... Uh, you know, you know of, of, of where we see good uh, researchers, where we see lots and lots of publications, where we see these, these good outcomes on these bibliometric measures, there also seems to be a lot of economic activity, right? There's a lot of innovation coming out of places like Stanford and Harvard and MIT. And so to the extent that we started looking at higher education as 
uh, an economic engine, which broadly we started to do in the early 60s and picks up in the 70s in the, in the Nixon administration in the U.S., um, people start to pay attention to these, these, uh, these bibliometric measures as policy indicators. And eventually we get, uh, you know, this sort of gets balloons, particularly around 2003 uh, when uh, the Shanghai Jiaotong Academic Ranking of World Universities comes out. So I'm on the Shanghai Board of Advisors, so I'll just I'll give you that disclosure right here. Um, you know, what Shanghai tried to do, you have to understand, the, the, the Chinese government, the Chinese universities were trying to reverse engineer prestige, right? Because the government of China said, we want, you know, so many, 10 universities in the top 100 by 2020. I think that was the goal. And so the universities themselves said, well, how do we get, what, what do they mean by that? How do we get there? And so literally they tried to reverse engineer it, and bibliometrics was the, the, the measure they tried to get at. And um, I will always tell you that, that the Shanghai rankings are an honest set of, an honest attempt to find, uh, how can I put this, pools of scientific talent. Hard sciences and engineering. And actually, if you read the Shanghai rankings that way, they actually make a lot of sense because they come from a view that world-classness, because they are the, you know, rank world-class universities, are a function of research. And that's, okay, that's relatively obvious. The research is, an, is a non-rivalrous good. The fact that I put it out there, everybody can enjoy it. Teaching, that other function that we have, that is a rivalrous good. There's only so many people you can stick into a classroom. I know some universities try and, you know, stretch that point a little bit, but it's... Um, you know, they can't. So th when you think about, like, what is it that makes a great university, it's always going to be research because that's what the most people can judge. And at this point, bibliometrics start to work against the social sciences and humanities because they lump everybody together, right? And so as you were saying, look, we've got very different kinds of publication and citation cultures across scientific uh, disciplines, across social sciences, even across humanities. Okay, so I do... You know, I'm, I won't bore you with the statistics from my stuff, but um, you know, even in those areas, you can see that some publication, some fields of publication, professors are six or seven times as likely to publish something in a year as somebody else. Um, you know, the uh, just to give you an example here, visual arts. Why I think visual arts is actually a difficult one to to say very much about. Seventy-five percent of the professors in visual arts in Canada do not have a single cited publication in Google Scholar. It's just not the way people in that field communicate, right? So it's very difficult to do these kinds of, of, of things. Uh, so at this point, I think you know people in social sciences humanities really start to push back at, at these bibliometric measures because they say, well, we look bad in comparison to the sciences. <laughs> And so things like what, uh, you know, Elliot's done actually do, they, because they bring the field normalization in, they actually restore the relevance of these things. And that's a, a great thing about it. Um, but those two charts that uh, he showed, let me just bring it here. Remember, the reason we care about research output is because it's an indicator of prestige. Now, this is a great chart right here because it actually shows, and and it's interesting, some of my colleagues in Germany have done this research as well. If you, ask, if you just ask professors, what's a good department? And then you line that up against bibliometric measures, you usually get answer, you know, correlations of about 0.8. Now, I'll come back to this in a second. Internationally, it turns out you can do the same thing in sciences. But you can't when you get to the social sciences and humanities. Now, I disagree a little bit about Elliot about the interpretation of this. I don't think it's actually because the social sciences and humanities are, uh, are, are, are different, because professors view it differently. I think it's because you can't do this internationally. I think it's because the discussions in the social sciences and humanities are much more fractured. For these metrics to make sense, you have to have a global scientific, you have to have a global conversation that everybody can be part of. And in a lot of the social sciences and humanities, you don't have that, right? We're much more geographically fractured in this area. And so what that means, I mean, I, you know, history is an example. I'm not surprised, you know, classics is an area where we do, you know, it's where we have a chance to do well, because that's actually a global conversation, right? Everybody teaches classics in more or less the same way. If we were heavy on Canadian history, 
uh, you know, that doesn't do you very much within the, the general field of history because no, almost nobody outside Canada is reading Canadian history. So, <clears throat> um, now I actually think we actually do, there are some global conversations within the social sciences and humanities, and the rule of thumb is basically the more quantitative and the more uh, mathematical they are, the more international the conversation is likely to be. Um, but, you know, as you head more and more into the, the humanities, that's going to be much more fractured. So <clears throat> I really appreciate the work that the committee's done, that Elliot's done in trying to make these comparisons. But genuinely, I don't think they're possible. I know that, you know, the, the, the reaction, well, we haven't got the right measures yet. I'm not convinced the right measures exist. This push to say, well, we need to do more about creative works. We need more books. We need those things. Those are all interesting. And I think they will help to redress the balance within institutions, you know, to, when you compare humanities to the sciences. Yeah, because the guys in astronomy and physics, they're pushing out seven, eight papers a year, often co-authored with, you know, three or four hundred other people. But, um, the, you know, they, and then, so they look down on the humanities, they say, wait a minute, you got one work in two years? Well, it's a fairly important book. You know, it's a book. It's a monogram. There's just different ways of, of, of communicating. And so bringing in these extra methods of communication help to, within the academy, help people understand the balance a little better. I don't think they change the fundamental difficulty in comparing different conversations around the world within humanities. So <clears throat> when I say who knows how we're doing in the humanities, I genuinely mean I suspect... This is, this is not a methodologically resolvable problem. Let me get to that second point. Who cares? I understand why Canada should care about having world-class research in science and engineering. I think the evidence, the, the economic evidence about the spin-offs in terms of uh, growth, in terms of economic benefits, are pretty... Uh, Undeniable, and particularly the fact that they come from public spending, right? That the public, you know, that, that public funding is doing this, they're doing research that the private sector cannot or will not, it's too risky. That's all good. I understand why Canada should care about world class research in most of the social sciences. Um, you know, again, I thought the presentation that Chad gave this morning was excellent. But it's pretty applied stuff he's talking about. You know, the stuff that he wants to push, the stuff that he thinks is a success, the stuff that he thinks is sellable, uh, is pretty applied. And um, it's applied in terms of, you know, making sure that we have an economy that works well, that is inclusive, that we have a society that addresses the needs of all its participants. This, a lot of the social science research does that. I don't understand what the national interest is in having world-class humanities research. And it's not because I don't understand the importance of the humanities. I think, and actually let me go back here. I understand the institutional imperative in having research, world-class research in the humanities. If I'm a U of T, if I'm a McGill, okay, I want to present an image to everybody that I have top scholars in all areas. Right? That's what they do, it's a prestige game. So I understand it from them. But from a national point of view, what's the interest in having world-class research in the humanities? I understand that humanities have a positive impact on society in a number of different ways. The most obvious, teaching. Okay? We hear that over and over again. If you read the, you know, the very true stuff that Martha Nussbaum, for instance, writes about the humanities... She's not talking about research. She's talking about the inculcation of critical thinking. If you were in this session that um, we were doing earlier today on, on uh, communicating social sciences and humanities, that's what everyone came back with. Everyone goes back to it. It's about inculcating critical thinking. It's about an appreciation of different points of view. It's about integrative thinking. That's all true. And very little of that is based on having world-class research. I think it's critical that the humanities be engaged Right? and engaged with society. The role of public intellectuals. Francis Woolley, who is one of the people who writes um, uh, Worthwhile Canadian Initiative, a very good Canadian economics blog. I mean, she made the point that said, look, she, if she added up all the, you know, the people who've read her academic articles, 
they probably would not equal the number of people who read one of her blog posts. She influences far more people through that kind of, um, through that different form of communication. And it's an intellectual form of communication. It's a challenging blog. I, it goes beyond my first year econ stuff, that's for sure. You know, it's, it's for people who are, it's very, very good. Um, it's important for people in humanities to connect to society, to other disciplines, to inform other disciplines. It's important that they have those functions of um, cultivating memory. Somebody made that a very nice phrase earlier today. But scientific, you know, publishing, does it matter that we have humanities researchers publishing in Thomson Reuters or Elsevier index journals? I don't see it to the same dimension. And I think, to me, it was just an occasion, another occasion, to reflect a little bit on the, one of the traps that I think a lot of humanities disciplines have found themselves in since about World War II. Um, you know, humanities were built for, uh, you know, there's those two views of the university, those of Cardinal Newman and those of uh, Humboldt. And the humanities were built for a Newman university, right? They were uh, small critical inquiry, not particularly about discovering new knowledge. In fact, I think Newman actually had quite a line in dispelling that notion of something that universities should be, should be doing. Um, but we're living in a Humboldt world, right? A world where we fund universities because they improve, they increase state power. That's exactly what Humboldt was after. And since World War II, so much money went into universities during World War II, and Vannevar Bush did such a good job of trying to keep some of it in the universities afterwards, only without the army guys looking, looking over everybody's shoulders. Um, you know, those parts of the university that got the money were seen as successful. And the rest of the university aped them, right? I mean, we didn't have, you know, a, a research granting agency. We didn't have a big research tradition in the humanities before, in Canada before about 1958, I guess, in the, uh, sort of the late um, Saint-Laurent era we didn't have large graduate programs in those fields. I mean, it was, you know, increasingly we remade humanities and to a lesser extent social sciences in the image of the hard sciences. And I'm not sure that was good for anybody. I mean, I understand the line, you know, it takes good research to be a good teacher. I'm not convinced we had worse teaching in the humanities when most people were on a 3-3 load than now that we're on a 2-2 load. And when we think about the benefit to the country, right, the benefit to the country is uh, that we are producing these critical minds at a reasonable cost. And we increased our costs enormously when we went from 3.3 to 2.2. Okay? So let me be clear. This is not an, in any way an attack on the humanities. It is simply to say, why, are we, why have we organized our humanities in order to meet the sort of criteria that will make us look good on the kinds of studies that the Canadian Council of Academies has done, I don't think the case is very good, to be honest with you. Um, I do think that, you know, that, that's not to take away from the excellent work that CCA has done. It's not in any way to suggest that we don't have great humanities teachers in this country. I just think it's time for a bit of a reset for all of us in thinking why we organize particularly humanities education the way we do. So that's my grenade for the day. <laughs> thank you, Jean-Marc, and thank you all. Maybe your grenade, but you can't just uh, launch it and walk away because now we're going to have a few minutes for, for Q&A, so I'll invite also Dr. Philipson. Thank you very much. I'm sure there are questions from the audience. Ah, ha, ha. Don't even have to encourage it. Could you come to the mic just because the acoustics are very, very bad in this room? And just introduce yourself to you. Hi, Lisa Phillips from York University, incoming member of the Board of the Federation. Really enjoyed the talks. Uh, Dr. Philipson, um, I, I thought the CCA report was great, one of its many fans, and thrilled to see the social science and the humanities uh, more upfronted in the 2012 version. I notice, however, in the budget this week, in the federal budget, in the discussion of research and innovation in Chapter 3.4 of the budget plan, they refer to your report and they cite only four of the six top fields that are highlighted in the report, which ones did they leave out? 
as being evidence of our strengths in science and technology and innovation, visual and performing arts, and historical studies. We're dropped out of the picture. So there's obviously still some work to do to persuade the government about the, you know, the relevance of this sort of well-rounded breadth of knowledge to innovation. And I just wonder whether uh, CCA is doing some follow-up discussion with the government about how they're going to build the report into their new strategy. Not sure if this is on. Yeah. Uh, well, I also noticed that uh, in the budget they quoted or cited four of the six, but uh, interestingly or otherwise, historical studies and visual and performing arts were not measured. It will not surprise you to know that I had no part in writing the federal budget. Um, and so whether that uh, is a significant oversight, because I think what is perhaps more important, at least if 2000, the 2006 report is any example to follow, the following year, or less than a year later, in 2007, the government issued its science and technology strategy and flowing from that, many of the newer programs, the, uh, the Caesars and the Cirques and other new programs were specifically targeted to the areas that had been identified as priorities in the council report the year before. So I think uh, what we should all be watching for is the next iteration, if there is to be one, of the science and technology strategy. In terms of what the Council of Canadian Academies uh, may be doing, understand I'm, I'm not a part of, I chaired their expert panel. Uh, the, the panel members are not uh, staff or employees of the Council. But the Council is very clear about its mandate, which is to provide objective, uh, independent, evidence-based assessments. It is not to be an advocate or to recommend policy. So uh, I don't pretend to speak on behalf of the Council, but I would bet you that they are not going to make any specific recommendations to government. Um, their job is to provide the best available evidence, and government will do with it as it wishes. John Williams from Ottawa. Uh, just a simple question. In your report, how do you define Canadian? Does it include uh, Canadians who are working abroad? Does it include non-Canadians, whatever that means, who are working here? No, it was very easy in the bibliometrics. Uh, it was any paper whose uh, principal investigator is domiciled or has an appointment in a Canadian institution. So Canadians working abroad, publishing under the name of Harvard, Stanford, or uh, University of London, would not be classified as Canadian research. Could I make a comment? The question hasn't been, well, it's been asked by, by Alex, but um, I, I was actually kind of amused. After the 2006 report, which again, I had nothing to do with, uh, the, the pushback from the humanities, arts, and social sciences, many of you will, will recall, was really quite heated, and I think perhaps justified, that their disciplines had, to a greater or lesser extent, been ignored in that report. So, as I said, we made a determined effort uh, to include your disciplines. There were no preconceived notions. It is interesting that three, if not four, of the six areas of strength that bubbled up happened to be from your disciplines. So, um, but, so now the, the question that Alex has posed is, well, who cares? I'm interested to see what the comment is going to be after the next report in five or six years. But I want to address the question about who cares. Because at one level, I must say I, I agree with many of your comments, but I think the who cares is, uh, is not a trivial question. And the answer I give is going to be a very practical one. It may not be the intellectually stimulating one that you're all looking for. But in this day and age, there are a number of features around the globe that characterize uh, research. Uh, there's an emphasis on excellence. All governments, all institutions wish to focus their research resources in areas of excellence. 
Um, another characteristic is, uh, and we heard a lot about it, is interdisciplinarity. And when governments in particular talk about it, they're not talking simply about research across intellectual disciplines, they're talking about across uh, geographic jurisdictions and across sectors, government, private, and uh, academic. So interdisciplinary in the broadest sense of the word. But another characteristic, and this is why I think who cares, this is where who cares becomes important, another characteristic is accountability. Not just in the sense of how, how was the money spent, where did it go, but since these are public funds, <clears throat> government wishes to know, and I think has a right to know, that, it's, that the public funds are being invested in research that at least is deemed excellent by its peers around the world. So, as I say, it's a very practical sort of mundane answer, but you should care because in the final analysis, the shirk budget comes through the Ministry of Industry. And so when the Minister of Industry, who commissioned this assessment, wants to know where are the areas of excellence, of strength, whether we like it or not, I think we have to provide an answer that includes your disciplines. And, and I would agree with that completely. When I say who cares, I think the answer is, the, the, what I'm raising is uh, the issue of whether or not these kinds of bibliometrics, these kinds of scientometrics, are fit for that purpose in the humanities. And that, that's all I'm raising. So I think the points about how good we are, and, and look, these are not going to be difficult, these are not going to be easy questions to answer. How connected are our intellectuals? How public are our intellectuals? How, uh, how, what do they do to engage the population? In, in, in you know the important debates of our time, how do they, those are the things it seems to me that matters about uh, the humanities. I just don't think you can get at it in a strictly if you're doing an international comparisons. I think you can do it domestically, right? Because the context is the same for all disciplines. So the kind of stuff, the kind of stuff that I do for for disciplines in the humanities, and some of you've been customers of our of our uh, of our services that do help you understand how you line up, say, you know, Waterloo against. McGill or Alberta, those kinds of things in history and philosophy. I think you can do that. I think taking an entire nation's output of philosophy and putting it up against, I don't know, the French, that's tough. I'm not sure you can do that. Yeah, they have it numbers. for breakfast. Yeah, exactly. It's not just a, a difficult competitor. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure bibliometrics is up to that task. And I think bibliometrics is up to a lot. I just don't think it, for, for, this group of institute, for this group of disciplines, this works. You need something a lot uh, more supple. And that's going to be more expensive, right? It's, it's, there's no question about that. But I think we have to think about what's the right way to do it. Well, let, let me stress, and I, I did this, I thought, throughout the talk, that we were sensitive to the fact that bibliometrics is not the be-all and end-all for any disciplines, but certainly not yours. And that's why we went to great length, and I must say great expense, to come up with other measures, and this slide, which is still there, we created in order to make the point that uh, international reputation in your disciplines is not correlated with bibliometrics, which is peer-reviewed published papers. It seems to me, and you can answer better than I can, we thought it would be relatively easy to get the bibliometric equivalent to books and book chapters. Bibliometrics is peer-reviewed papers in, in journals. Books and book chapters are published, and we thought, well, that will be relatively easy. It won't cover every, all the research output in the humanities, art, and social sciences, but would certainly go a long way, certainly for the social sciences and to a greater, uh, lesser extent for the humanities. But there, were, there are no international databases that we could access. We could we can make statements about how many books were published in Canada in each field, but we have nothing to compare it with. That was the point I was making, that there's a challenge. And I think something like books and book chapters, it becomes more difficult with presentations, uh, design uptake, the sort of thing that people in the creative uh, arts, uh, the type of research dissemination that they use. Um, and so, Alex, I agree with you about bibliometrics, but I don't think we should just say, well, therefore, it can't be done, and uh, let, let's forget about it. 
I think that there is something that can be done. It just it will it will take a global effort. It's not it's not a Canadian alone responsibility. But if I if I when I was listening to your two presentations, you had radically take home messages. I thought, um, Dr. Philipson, you're you're encouraging us by saying uh, our metrics aren't up yet to the task of measuring what you do, but we know that what you do is important, and we sense that just as we saw with historical studies and visual arts, that Canada can rank very highly in terms of its social sciences and humanities. Alex, on the other hand, is saying, you know what? Um, maybe we don't need these kind of metrics. Maybe institutions should find other ways of measuring what the social sciences and humanities do. Maybe we should go back to more teaching. Maybe there are other ways of making an impact as scholars then through, through trying to catch up with the way that science and technology is measured. So I'm like thinking, uh, I don't know if anyone else saw that, I just like really mixed messages here. So maybe you could help us uh, understand what we should take home in terms of uh, to our associations or to our institutions even, and individually as scholars, um, in terms of that mixed message. Oh, me, okay. Um. I, I'm never one to tell people not to measure things, but I, I do think it's, that's my business. Um, you went beyond the measurement. I, you I, went. Be, you went also said about the actual research, right? It's yeah, this no, no, and, and I just and it's a, it's a genuine concern about what the humanities are for, because I think if you look at all of our public discourse about the humanities, I'm not. The social sciences are different. I mean, I, I, some I of the social some sciences. of the social sciences. Again, as you, as you get less mathematical, less quantitative, it's, it's, a, it's a continuum. Um, I always like to talk about social sciences being applied humanities. And so if you sort of think of it that way, it's, um, it, you know, it's <laughs> pure and applied. If it becomes a little easier to understand. But in those sort of pure humanities, um, all the defenses we give for it, all the reasons, ways we promote it, they're not research-based. So why are we making the case for these disciplines in terms of the research? I just, I don't... Give, I don't think the, the kinds of things that, that Elliot is saying are required to, to get at that metric are going to take decades. They're going to be expensive. Uh, and I'm just not sure it's worth it because if we're serious about the, promoting the humanities, the real thing we need to be talking about is, in fact, quantify. There's a very different set of things we need to quantify. What are students learning? You know, the, the argument that we make, not always with a lot of data that the purpose of the humanities is to inculcate critical thinking, and not just inculcate critical thinking, but we do it better than everybody else. That's the subtext whenever we have that discussion. That's, that's what you want to quantify, really. I mean, if we're just talking about is, are the humanities doing their job, I'd far prefer to see an effort on that and to justify an investment in the humanities and the promotion of the humanities based on that than I would based on research. Obviously, I, based on this experience, I take a different point of view, but from a purely intellectual point of view, I gave you a practical reason, namely the Shirk's budget comes from the minister. But while this slide is up, I'm glad you used uh, my, my slides. Um, because the, <laughs> the, the, uh, Ever the scientist? The data point that has the highest international reputation on that slide, the data point just under 80%, is uh, philosophy and theology. <laughs> 70, <laughs> close to 80% of the international experts said Canada was one of the top five countries. And in fact, I showed it on the, the graphs, it was number three in the world. And yet, by its ARC rank, at number eight, in terms of the top 1% of papers, you can see it's middle of the rank. From a purely intellectual point of view, I want to know, why do so many of your international colleagues rate Canadian philosophy and theology so highly? Uh, because it obviously is not correlating with the x-axis. So I think from a purely intellectual curiosity point of view, we, we would like to know. Is it the fact that you've read their books 
and book chapters, I suspect that's one, or is it the fact that you happen, happen to know personally a few of Canada's outstanding researchers and that your view is based solely on that? It would be interesting to know. And I would suspect in that case, a lot of it has to do with a public intellectual called Charles Taylor. So the idea is that the, the reputational is often has to do with the voice, the public voice, yeah. that a scholar is willing to give. I don't think we have the mechanisms in place in our institutions to really push forward those kinds of, of public intellectuals. And, and it can be, I mean, again, again, the smaller the field you get, the, right. the more likely it is that it, the, those, those well, two things. One is that the number of respondents to the survey drops so low that it loses some meaning. And I, visual arts, for instance, I think you had 12 respondents in there. And that's, you know, there's only so many people out there in that field who are in the top 1%. It's not a very big field. So you're basing half that ranking there on 12 responses. Um, it's tough. I don't think you could have done much else about it. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, just given the limitations of what you have, you can't go and talk to each of these people individually. The response rate's going to be what the response rate's going to be. It's tough. But also, the smaller the field, the more a country's reputation is going to be affected by one or two people and exactly I mean Charles, Charles Taylor was the first one that came to mind so I don't know if we have any other questions but I want to let you know that we're going to continue this conversation um, because we're going to take a very short break or no we're not going to take the break yet we are going to be talking about public intellectuals uh, with John Ralston Saul in just a little while but before we do I wanted to know if you had any closing thoughts um, that you would give to uh, the researchers in this field or in the scholars in the room as we go back to our institutions and associations? <laughs> you can uh, throw another grenade. It's no, fine. No, no, we can no, no, take no. it. I, I think, the, I think the, one's in, the one is enough. I, I think... I mean, for me, the, the issue... And, and it, it's just, I would just reiterate something Chad said earlier today. And that was that social sciences and humanities let the debate about metrics get away from them in the 80s and 90s, right? There was a lot of pushback about this isn't for us. It's not uh, right. We don't want to be judged this way. And too often that got interpreted as, and who knows, it may have been meant this way, as just get off my back, don't judge me. It's not good enough anymore. In, in no field, if you've, you know, the, all the stuff that's been written about the audit society, the, the decline of trust in institutions, the fact is you're a public utility now. 80% okay, of young people go through universities and colleges now. You're almost as universal as high schools. You're going to be regulated that way. If you don't get out in front of those discussions about metrics, you're going to get dumb metrics. And so I really think that, uh, you know, be proactive in this discussion about metrics. Um, even if they're crazy and difficult to implement. Uh, and, and I think a lot of, you know, this is a difficult, these are difficult fields to evaluate. Get out ahead of it, think about it, be proactive. Thank you. Dr. Philipson? Well, I think I've delivered uh, my, my messages. Um, the major one, specifically for your community is the, the charge, as it were, the challenge that I put out, namely that in, in this day and age of computing power, I don't think it is beyond the, the wit of this community to come up with metrics that are relevant and meaningful and can be measured and uh, in which Canada can even take a leadership role in terms of getting a global measurement. I mean, after all, bibliometrics began somewhere and it's now global. So I've, I've delivered that message. The other message, though, that I think, and as an outsider, I, I would congratulate your community. As I said, the panel did not have any preconceived notions. The four or five members of the panel from your disciplines were vastly outnumbered by physicists, chemists, physicians, and, and others. But at the end of the day, at least three, and certainly part of a fourth, of the six strengths came up in your discipline. So I, I personally think that you are collectively to be congratulated and that you should feel very good about it. In fact, my reaction would have been, who cares if it's flawed? We came up, <laughs> <laughs> we, we came up number one, two, and three. Don't stress the, uh, the flaws. 
you only use flaws in process when you don't like the outcome of something. <laughs> Well, I guess so and there's, there, there's my message is, uh, is is a very positive one, I think, for this community, and that is that we have in Canada a great deal to be proud of in terms of fields. And as I said, if you look at the report in the subfield, three of the subfields, Canada is ranked number one by bibliometrics. So it's out there. To, so it's up to the community, in a sense, to to be proactive, to get the communications going and to get the, the metrics right. We're going to need help, perhaps, Dr. Phillipson. You can be one of our next, uh, our next uh, public angels, right? We can have someone out there, out front, um, celebrating the community uh, as you did in terms of the way that your report uh, came out. But also, Alex, we are going to need your help in building some metrics. So if you have any spare time, you can maybe give it to us. <laughs> All right. We're going to take a very short break, and I'm going to ask you all to be here in about 10 minutes so that uh, we'll have ample time to continue our discussion with uh, John Ralston. So, Dr. Philipson, uh, Alex Usher, thanks very much. Before you go, regar regardless of what the metrics say, we're actually presenting you with books as a gift. So uh, they're not staple journal articles. Um, and it's just a very small token pour vous dire merci beaucoup.